This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Click the link in the description to get 83% off for two years plus three months for free. In these uncertain times, we've all had to adapt and get scrappy to get by. While change is never fun, we here at We're in Hell would like to raise a toast to those who've been able to adapt and flourish. Whether you've spent the last two years filming hour-long videos about reality shows in your bedroom, or recruiting childhood acquaintances into joining a pyramid scheme over Facebook, here's to you. To all the hustlepreneurs who finish their 9 to 5 and then start grinding from 5 to 9, we salute you. This wouldn't be hell without you. Hey everyone. In this video, I'm going to be continuing my journey through every type of reality show, and for this month, we're going to talk about the genre that I like to call business shows. I'm talking about shows like Shark Tank or Undercover Boss that focus on the ins and outs of running a business. Now, if you're new here, on this channel, I don't like to cover just your run-of-the-mill trash shows. Instead, I go digging around in the underground reality show scene to find some hidden gems which are made of garbage. And <laughs> oh man, this month I found something real dark. In this video, I'm going to be talking about a reality show for entrepreneurs called I Quit. By the way, sorry about the clickbait thumbnail. To be clear, I'm not quitting. As a matter of fact, look at the length of this video. Being burnt out has only made me stronger. I Quit follows the ups and downs of the entrepreneurs behind six small businesses who, in the first episode, all quit their day jobs to go all in on running their own companies. Now, this might sound kind of whatever, right? Like, it was made by the Discovery Channel. On its face, it just sounds at worst boring. The thing is, I Quit is kind of amazing in that it takes that boring premise and makes a show where just about every part of it feels in some way wrong. For example, every bad reality show has crappy, generic music they play during the transitions, right? Well, Listen to what they play in I Quit. Jesus Christ, that's not a happy song, dude. After I heard that, I was half expecting them to play an EDM remix of The Cats in the Cradle, but cut up to be about how awesome the dad is. But the thing that actually makes this show dark is that I Quit, just like life itself, is a contest show. While the contestants never meet each other and all seem to think that the show is just about them, they're all being evaluated by three people. Harvey Finkelstein, the COO of Shopify, Trisha Clark Stone, the CEO of WP Narrative, and Debbie Sterling, the CEO and founder of Goldie Blocks. The show refers to these three as mentors, and while they do all meet with the contestants and give advice, for the rest of the video, I'm gonna call them the judges, since the main thing they do is judge the entrepreneurs and pick a favorite who they surprise at the end by giving them $100,000. The entrepreneurs who fail, they get back up, they learn, they improve, and they get better. Those are the entrepreneurs that might go home with $100,000. And so while that's the premise, the magic really happens in the execution. So with that all set up, let's dive into the show. intro wasn't 20 minutes long this time. To celebrate, let me real quick tell you about this video's sponsor. 
I'm about to describe some very bad and also incredibly funny companies, but you know what company isn't bad or funny in any way? Surfshark VPN. Whether you're quitting your job to start your own company or just surfing the web, we could all stand to gain by taking our online privacy more seriously. <laughs> Why did I write it like that? Surfshark basically creates a private internet connection for you, which helps prevent your online activity from being monitored by hackers, trackers, your ISP, or any three-letter government agency that might be trying to shut down your fledgling small business. That last one might not be true. Surfshark's good, but it probably can't protect you from the tyranny of the FDA. Nothing can. Also, if you're going to build a barge in international waters so that you can operate your business free of any laws, then you're going to need to wow some high-level investors. Thanks to Surfshark, with a click of a button, you can change your device's location to get at region-locked content, thus allowing you to impress your potential business partners with your extensive knowledge of German Netflix. And right now, for a limited time, if you click the link in the description, go to surfshark.deals slash we're in hell, or use the promo code we're in hell, all one word, no apostrophe, at checkout, you'll get 83% off plus an additional three months for free, and also help out the channel a little bit. All right, now let's get into it. The first company featured on I Quit is Blue Coolers. Blue Coolers has an I would say damningly simple business model. There's other coolers out there that do the same things that our coolers do, and it's super competitive. We're just trying to do it at an affordable price by producing in China. That's it. <laughs> at one point, one of the judges asked them why she couldn't just do the exact same thing and put them out of business, and they just have no answer. What if, after meeting you guys, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna start Red Coolers. <laughs> so now I'm gonna start Red Coolers. <laughs> And I know this is 160 bucks. Can I come in at 130? And look, I'm certainly in no position to be that critical here. There are tons of things that I buy that are produced in ways that are in no way ethical. That said, it's very funny how throughout the show, blue coolers are framed as these like scrappy underdogs taking on Yeti, their main cooler competition. And while no corporation can ever really be ethical, Yeti is for sure way better than blue coolers. We get a lot of questions from us about how is your cooler different from a Yeti? So the idea is let's cut them in half and show our whole business model is that it's the same and it's half the price. Part of why Yeti is more expensive is because all their stuff is manufactured in America. And while they're definitely not perfect and I don't know everything about how they operate, <laughs> if you dig around a little bit, you can find that they have pretty strict ethics policies for the practices of their vendors and manufacturers, laying out what I would consider to be the bare minimum in terms of ethical behavior, like not using slavery or child labor. Blue Coolers doesn't have any of that. I say all this not to plug Yeti, but to point out that I Quit makes a big deal of how innovative Blue Coolers are. But the innovation they're talking about is a willingness to use slave labor. Like, it's hard to take a Cinderella story seriously when the scrappy underdog is also the one using sweatshops. Now, let's get into the two guys behind this innovation, Chris and Marcus. First, there's Chris. Before quitting in episode one, he actually owned a company with his brother, which he ends up quitting on camera, and it's unbelievably uncomfortable. You know I've been doing the coolers for the last year with Marcus. Yeah. I've got to quit. Right I get, now, I get my it. heart of hearts, it's, it's like you're a traitor. But I also know that you're my brother, and at the end of the day, you want what's best for me. That's part of the reason that it's so upsetting to me. This is so fucked, too, because for the rest of the show, he talks about how family is the most important thing to him, or how he's doing blue coolers because he wanted a family business, and it's like... You had that and then fucked over your brother to jump ship with your shithead college buddy. I'm not taking this step to leave him hanging. Um, I'm taking this step to better my family. To me, priorities are God, family. 
baseball business. We have people all the time ask us, are you brothers? You guys kind you of, that? there's a res slight resemblance. Like you're a traitor. Then there's Marcus, who I don't like. We got four kids. Obviously, that's a, that's a juggling act. And Jamie here juggles most of it. Don't you? <laughs> okay. Now, Marcus's motivation for starting the company is for sure better. His son has dwarfism, and he talks about how he's worried that he'll face discrimination and so wants to make this company so his son will always have a guaranteed job. I can imagine that he's going to run into certain prejudices and challenges as he tries to go into the professional world. Bye, buddy. Man, it would be cool to be able to give him an opportunity to step into a, an existing business. Which, I don't know, I, I certainly can't fault a parent for wanting to do whatever they can for their kid. That said, by quitting his job, Marcus put his family's finances in jeopardy and also probably lost his health insurance, which, if you're worried about your disabled son, that's maybe not the best. But also, when you see Marcus quit, it feels a bit more like he's doing it for himself than for his family. Last night, I was on the phone till 11.30. There's 80 emails, a bunch of requests from my boss. I have got to quit that job. So, as you've probably seen the last several weeks, maybe, I've been fairly distracted. Just measuring it all out, I said, I, I have to quit. I, I, like, I have to quit my day job because it's just not fair to everybody else, right? Yeah. I might be making a, the dumbest decision of my life, man. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Like, it's presented as him trying to be all cool, but to me, that just comes off as, like, big Kendall Roy energy. Man, I am too old for this. Lucy, I'm home. And speaking of their families, neither of these guys' wives are at all on board with this, and it's very fucked up to watch them tell their families they quit their jobs. I met with Uncle Dave, and I quit. And I switched to the blue coolers. It's a huge step. I'm, but, I'm super nervous about it. I mean, how are you guys gonna make money? Well, it's done. I mean, I'm, I now don't have a job. So, oh, that's okay. I just want you to realize it puts a lot of pressure, like, on me. Bottom line is, is I jumped ship already, so. I know, I like, know. Any angst, any fear we have, it's just the reality. Got a lot of kids, a lot of bills, a lot of stuff, you know? Are, are you still on, on Team Blue Coolers, or? Do you want to go run off with the neighbor? There's nothing, if Which I could, fine, if, if we were in a situation that you didn't have to feel it, I would be like. I know. But it, it is what it is. Like, I can't, I know, it is, that's what, that bird is there, it's real. Oh, yeah. Come here, come here. I hate when I make you cry. This is especially dark, too, because these guys quit their jobs around April 2019, which, um, if you fast forward a month, American history buffs might recognize that as an unbelievably shitty time to have a business entirely dependent on importing cheaply made goods from China. Uh, so, not so good news. There's this list of products that are untariff right now, which coolers has been tariff-free. Trump tweeted, that list will bump to 25% tariffs. And so, right after quitting their jobs, these guys just spend the next month sitting at home glued to Trump's Twitter feed. So I'll have to look at what's going on with all these tariffs that Trump placed on China, where we manufacture our product. Is it weird finding me just <laughs> hanging around the house on the couch in the middle of the day? It is weird. So... How's things going? How's sales? I'm wondering when we're gonna start making some money. We're making money. Yeah. Where's it all going? 
back into the business. <laughs> yeah. It's also really funny, when this happens, the judges say how tough this is, but that as an entrepreneur, you have to get knocked down and get back up again until you build up a sort of resilience. It must feel like you got punched in the gut. I know that's how I usually felt. Yeah, what happens the second time that setback happens, it feels less bad. And the third time, even less bad. And eventually you build this resiliency. You build yeah. this sort of anti-fragileness to it's you. It's like a muscle. Which every time, exactly. Yeah. Every time something breaks, it comes back stronger. And yeah, sure, like that's generally true. But also, I'm not sure how much having a thick skin helps someone deal with the fact that a trade war just made their business no longer profitable. And I know it seems like I'm being really mean here, and I kind of am. Let me say that I would not be this mean if things didn't go extremely well for them at the end. They have to deal with manufacturing and shipping issues throughout the show. I'm not really sure why, but at a certain point, the tariffs aren't an issue anymore, even though I'm pretty sure they're still in place now, almost three years later. But then at the end, they go to one truck rally and sell like $45,000 worth of coolers. In a single day, Marcus and Chris have sold every cooler they brought with them and taken enough pre-orders to clean out their inventory back in Utah for a total of $45,000 in sales. So they're fine. <laughs> Damn, imagine the numbers they could have put up in Ottawa. Okay, there's more I could say about blue coolers, like how Chris sees coaching his son's high school baseball team as far more important than the business. Chris, it's your partner trying to get a hold of you. But it's also hard for him to do some of the stuff he needs to do when he's spending five or six hours a day at the baseball field. God, family. baseball business. Or how Marcus then tries to rat fuck Chris. If I were to say, Chris, I'm out, this business probably explodes. Oh, right. And no, no doubt about it. If I said I'm out, I'm not doing anything more, Marcus, you're doing this on your own. I you would couldn't probably, do it. I would probably still figure it out. <laughs> you couldn't do it. <laughs> I think I would. You're asking me to put my time in and not be compensated. So what are, so, uh, what are you right? saying then? Well, no, I am, I'm just but, saying, is that, but, but is that you, equitable? Yes. That is fair. But I got a lot more freaks to get to, so let's keep moving now with Jen. This woman is awesome. She quits her six-figure Wall Street job that she seems to absolutely hate. Every, every day I go into work, I, I die a little bit inside. Just a little bit, you know, you just chip away. You're like, okay. We all do, Jen, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm like slowly just becoming a shell of myself. And then I need to do something that I love. And then goes all in on Clado, her business where she sells Brigadeiros, a popular Brazilian dessert. This should be uncomplicatedly good, since more delicious desserts and fewer people working on Wall Street is objectively a net good for the world. But what pushes Jen over the edge from being just a cool bakery owner to full-fledged girl boss goddess, anointed with the blood and viscera of every artisanal donut maker in an eight block radius of her old Wall Street office building, is that she's not in the Brigadero business. She's in the empire business. I'm leaving everything I have to pursue, which some may say is a pipe dream, but I see it as an empire that just hasn't been built yet. Jen's expectations for how her business will turn out are absolutely wild. In the first episode, she explains that her dad has cancer and that she needs the business to be success, not just to take care of him, but... And I am afraid that he's not gonna be here for that long. And it's scary. I need him to be at the stock market when we go public and we ring that bell. Something that's really interesting is that the judges are way more critical of Jen than I think any of the other contestants, but they don't come down on her for things like expecting to take her confection business public within the first couple of years, but instead because of what I think are some of the more reasonable choices she makes. About halfway through the show, Jen decides that she wants to get a physical store with an industrial kitchen so that she can ramp up production and also move from only operating online to sort of a retail situation. And the judges all think that this is the worst idea imaginable. I'm worried they're just focused on the wrong things. 
Let me see you hit at least a million dollars in revenue online before we start trying to open up our first store. No one knows who they are. She continues to look at storefronts, which is just a waste of time right now. And to be fair, there are definitely risks and disadvantages to a brick and mortar store. The costs are much higher and most businesses in the food industry fail in their first year. Also, something that's really funny is how when Jen and her husband are looking over the lease for the place they decide to rent, Jen is horrified when she realizes that to make rent, they'd have to sell 3,000 Brigaderos a month. The rent range is 5,000 to 6,000. <laughs> that's cute. I have to sell 3,000 Brigaderos a month. Yeah. Just to cover rent. Right. Like, yeah, that's actually how most businesses work. <laughs> not to be mean, but 3,000 sales a month is not a lot, especially since this woman also thinks that she'll be making $100,000 in her first year. In an ideal world, I'd love to say we'd make 100,000 year one. Is it realistic? Only one way to find out. Absolutely iconic that she goes so quickly from the world will know my name to, wait, you mean I actually have to sell these Brazilian truffles? And so like, sure, there are absolutely problems with her plan to open this physical location, but the judges constantly talk about this, like it's this insane fantasy. Have you listened to her? Opening up a physical store is probably the only realistic goal that she has. Also, the judges give her just terrible advice. At one point, one of them says that she doesn't need to ramp up production capabilities because if she sells out, her brigadeiros will become valuable collector's items. The best case scenario is she runs out of brigadeiros. Now all of a sudden, the demand for it goes up because there's their limited edition. No, that's not how confections work. If the pizza place near my apartment is closed one day, I don't start scouring the secondary market for a scalper with a fridge full of margarita slices. I just go somewhere else for lunch. Plus, there is definitely a logic to opening a brick and mortar store. In the first episode, Jen's whole pitch for her company was that she started it because she couldn't find anywhere that sold Brigaderos in America. So when Justin and I got together, I made him a batch and we've always wondered why they haven't come to the US. But one of the disadvantages of being an online business is that you have to compete with people all over the world. There are definitely a lot more sites selling Brigaderos online than there are Brigadero stores in New Jersey. My favorite thing with Jen though is that after quitting her job, she kind of just sits at home and procrastinates. All right, so being home while Jesse's at work, it is a little hard to stay focused. I'm trying to not to get sucked into like the analysis paralysis where you just analyze things for so long and you're paralyzed, like you make no progress. So I'm trying to avoid that as much as I can. Like yesterday, I just learned a little bit of JavaScripting. So that was a, a highlight of my, of my day. This is just unbelievably relatable content for me. So I just love feeling seen. Now, I don't find the next three contestants that I'm going to talk about that interesting, so I'm going to try and speed through them a little bit before ending off on quite possibly the most deranged shit I've ever seen. Okay, so first off, there's Versatire. It's a clothing company started by this guy Matteo, and he makes stretchy dress shirts. We've got shirts. Shirts? I need these shirts super bad. Part of why this one isn't that interesting is because Mateo is just a very normal person. <laughs> He's just a pretty regular guy who quits his job as a teacher because of his passion for shirts. I realize that doesn't make him sound that regular. Also, this is for sure one of the most fucked up scenes of someone quitting though, since his boss does definitely seem pretty worried. I have to quit. What? Come on. Yeah. Which the show frames as her being concerned for him. It's probably not what you want to hear. It seems like a risk. But 
I feel like she's probably a bit more concerned about the fact that it seems like he's just quitting during the school year and not really giving her any notice. Also kind of a funny thing is that throughout the show, they all meet with the judges to get their advice. So the first time that Mateo meets Harvey, he asks Mateo to tell him about himself. And then Mateo tells him some extremely personal stuff about his relationship with his father. Before we sort of get into the nuts and bolts of the business and how you're building and what you're building, tell me a bit about your background. My father had a brain tumor and the surgery and multiple surgeries didn't go well. And so for my whole life, pretty much, he was immobile in a rehab center. Mm -hmm. He could never fulfill that role that he always wanted to be a provider for us. I think that he just wanted to know how you got the idea for the shirt, dude. But damn, uh, I'm sorry. Mateo's main arc, though, is him learning to value his wife, Julia, who is extremely involved in the business and seems to be much better than Mateo at basically everything. She's accounting this right here that's folded under. Oh, OK, yeah, yeah. So that's why it's a little short. Yeah, no, you're speaking her language. I'd like to have a prop. You're doing everything. You're doing everything. Low budget, Paris photo shoot, check. Like, as an owner, like, you gotta, like... I know, no, I mean, this is a learning opportunity like, again. on top of people. You're getting email back from the investor. So, this is good. I definitely don't think you should write him back yet. We need to, like, think about each of those questions. I'm just gonna write him back really quick. Nope. No. But it isn't until about halfway through the show that after being pressured by the judges, Mateo realizes that any of the work that Julia's done should be compensated or acknowledged. And then he gives her 50% ownership of the company. Make her feel like she's the co-founder that thought, she is. It, literally, the conversation of a 50-50 has just never come up. And it's not purposeful. Just I just never thought about it. He then takes her to Paris Fashion Week to celebrate, but also continues to talk over her in meetings to say things that are wrong. How do we keep up? And I How do we grow our collection quick enough yeah. so that we can continue to grow off the trend? My, my goal is to have a collection growth beyond dress shirts, right? I want to go into short sleeve shirts. I want to go into, into pants. A lot of founders have shiny toy syndrome. There's all <laughs> these shiny toys they want to build. You got that syndrome really badly. <laughs> yeah, like when he says new product line, I'm like, er, like yeah. you know, just she's, like she's, now. Let's she's, focus on what we have now. I think so. I'm the helium balloon, balloon, <laughs> and she's the stake in the ground. Now, while that is obviously shitty, generally Mateo and Julia are a pretty nice couple. Don't worry, we'll get to some real shitty relationships soon. The one good couple on the show is Mike D and his wife Gloria. I feel a bit bad since there isn't much to say about these two since they just seem like lovely people. Mike started his barbecue sauce company in memory of his son who died at six months old. He eventually quit his job at a progressive nonprofit where his wife still works so that he could spend more time with his kids. The show makes a big deal of showing how great and wholesome of a guy Mike is, and I say that not to cast doubts on whether or not it's true, but instead to point out that from the very beginning, it's very obvious that he's going to win. The last time Jordan said that she was faster than me, we raced and I won. She said I was cheating, so now I have to prove that I can beat them. <laughs> Not only does the editing highlight how good of a person he is, but the judges are constantly fawning over him, saying how much they love that, like, he sold his house to fund his business. This was the only home Aaron ever saw. The, the short period of time that he was not in the hospital, he was here. So he, he spent about two and a half weeks here. So we've had lots of, lots of good memories in this house. You talk about commitment, he's putting everything on the line. He literally has sold his family's home to ensure his business has enough runway. Now that is a true entrepreneur. Totally. Which, like, go Mike D, he is great, but that is kind of an insane thing to do. Also, at one point he gets his sauce into a local chain of grocery stores, and the judges make a big thing out of how innovative and clever this is of him. With the help of Gloria, Mike D's now meeting with these grocery stores who can then resell his products to the end consumer. 
and the pivot away from just having a direct to consumer business to actually also having a great wholesale business. The fact that he's evolving his thinking and really iterating and growing the business, it sounds like someone that we would really want to double down on. Like, for sure, it's cool that he did that, but I don't know, it kind of just seems like the most obvious thing to do. And I don't know anything about business, but it seems like a bit of a stretch to be like, this guy is completely disrupting the barbecue sauce industry. Instead of selling it at a trade show or online as an NFT, he has it available at a grocery store. This guy's a business genius. I would have just poured the sauce down the toilet. Okay, on to the next business, Ez Revere Wines, which was started by three best friends, Ashanti, Taishimia, and Jasmine. So right off the bat, something that's different with this one is that none of these women can afford to quit their day jobs. You still have full-time jobs, yeah. yeah, right? If I could quit, I would have quit, but I couldn't do it. If I quit, it's gonna be detrimental. How do I pay my portion of the business? The judges very much don't like this and keep saying that their company isn't a business, but just a hobby. It sounds more and more like it's an expensive hobby. There needs to be a level of sacrifice. So my question is, is this sustainable, this model, and then does this model get you to the level it's of success? It's not ideal, but it's what's financed. It's what we have to do at this point. Which. I get that the name of the show is I Quit, but also the wine business seems to me like a pretty expensive one to get into, so maybe that makes sense? But nope, when they first meet one of the judges, Trisha Clark Stone, she asks them what the number one thing they need for their business is, and they say money. So what needs to happen? Need capital. Need, number one, it needs capital. And then she says. But you know what? Everyone says. We can do better if we had capital. Right. Yeah, because they do. And she says this immediately after criticizing them for not quitting their jobs. Obviously, they need more money to do that. Then she tells them that they need a new label because theirs is too basic. This doesn't draw me in. Mm -hmm. I don't get that it's three African-American women wanting to disrupt an industry, so they created their wine. It's basic. And again, how are they going to pay for that? Also, this part's so brutal. After that, Trisha tries the wine, and then it just cuts away and never shows her reaction. A toast to no basic bitches here. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. Toast. Trisha says for our label, to tell a story that has to do something to stand out more. We'll, we'll see, see you thank soon. You. Yes, thank you, guys. But as Revere is pretty interesting in that it shows the ways that businesses do and don't need capital. The women do make some undeniably bad calls. They get invited to be part of an all-black wine tasting event at a festival in New Orleans, but don't have enough money for all the wine that they would need to go to it. And so to get that, they go to their winemaker and basically ask him for a line of credit. And he's just like, no. I don't do that. I'm a winery, okay? I'm not a financial institution. I'm not in the business of loaning money. It's like, you know, I build the wine, but someone else does the funding. They wind up getting a loan from a friend and get the wine and go to the event only to find out that it was more of a networking thing than a sales event. I feel like this is gonna be more of a chase and less about sales. It's not a sales event. It's just not. So they're not really here to purchase wine like that. They're here to sip, 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 get drunk real quick, and go about their business. If they'd had a ton more money, there's a good chance they still would have made that exact same mistake, but it definitely wouldn't have had that big of an impact on them, right? The show frames this as this complete disaster, and it kind of was. They're now in a ton of debt, but... The businesses that do well on the show also make mistakes. Mateo and Julia didn't really get anything out of it when they go to Paris Fashion Week, but because they had more money, that didn't matter. But the weirdest part with Ez Revere is the fight that they have when they go to New Orleans. They all stay together in like an Airbnb, and Ashanti, who, by the way, you can see here that she packed five different fedoras plus the one that she's wearing when she gets there. Fucking awesome. 
So partway through the night, Ashanti's cold, and so she turns off the AC and turns on the heater, and the next morning, everyone else is pissed that she did that. You're the reason why I was in a sweat box. Oh, yo, I had oh. to. Why is it clicked to heat? Did you click it to heat? I clicked it to heat. You're the reason why I was <laughs> no. I was freezing. You couldn't just turn it off. You put heat. And like, sure, that's fair enough. I'd be mad if my friend did that too, but it's not that big of a deal, right? <laughs> when I first watched it, I figured that the only reason they were including this argument was like to pad the runtime and manufacture drama, but then, nope. They wind up having a friendship ending fight because of the fucking thermostat. You turn that heat on again, I'm busting your ass. And I <laughs> no, that was mad selfish, though. We don't want to talk about selfishness. We don't want to go into that. Please, let's not do that. Please, for the rest of the night. can't take honesty. Don't make a state high. I don't know if I hit her. I, I don't remember. I, body to body, physically touched her first. And then I think to get me off of her, she pushed me, like, got me off of her. And then we started to get, you know, I will get physical with somebody if I'm poked. Rookie mistake, honestly. One of the first things they teach you in business school is that if you're considering starting a company with your two best friends, first ask yourself if waking up a bit sweaty would make you cut them out of your life forever. Okay, those are all the less interesting companies. I saved the most insane one for last, though. So before I quit, Sabrina worked in the music industry running her own PR company, which handled some pretty big clients. I think she was about 50 at the start and was planning to retire early in the next few years. So, you know, not rich, but definitely comfortable. This all changed when her husband Alex came home one day and told her that he'd spent all of their retirement money to buy a semi-pro soccer team. <laughs> and that's their business on the show. Now, I think it should be obvious that a soccer team is pretty different from the other small businesses on the show. Like, it's kind of a stretch to call that a business at all. It's more the kind of thing rich people get into because they just really love soccer and or want to launder money. And then if they're able to like make some income off of that down the line, all the better. Sabrina quits her job to run the soccer team with Alex because as she is very open about, her husband is a fucking moron. I need to get out of the music industry because Alex, he knows nothing about business. And we're putting all of our money into this club. So it was either lose the money or jump on board and be all in. There is so much to go over here. But first of all, I can't stress enough how much of a fucking reptile Alex is. Just in every situation, he finds new ways to be the worst possible person. We're losing a significant amount of money. And I'm trying to rob Peter to pay Paul in order to get this business up and going. So I really don't have a choice. It has to work. Only to prove to Sabrina that she was wrong. And I was right all along. He keeps saying how he's the brains of the operation behind the scenes. She's the face. I'm just the brains and behind the scenes person. Wait a minute. You're the brain and I'm not. Which I guess is a fun way of saying that he's the one who made the horrible mistake of buying this soccer team and now doesn't do any of the work. He'll complain that Sabrina is too bossy because like she's trying to stop them from becoming homeless. Working together has changed our relationship because I'm bossy and it irritates him that I'm bossy. Just do what I say, please. It may seem like I'm emasculating him, but I'm not. Huh? Is your fly open? But then he blames her for them losing a ton of money because she's the one who's supposed to be in charge of marketing. Something has to change and you're the marketer, so you better stop. Don't try to put that pressure on me. People just didn't feel like they, they needed to come out. Oh, but I thought they come rain, sleet, snow. Oh, you know? but I thought there was gonna be a thousand people here. <sighs> oh yeah, also he stops paying their mortgage so that he can put more money into the team. So how late are you with the mortgage, to be exact? One month. And when are you gonna make the payment? The end of the month. No. You get paid this Friday. Yeah, but the end of the month, because I have, to, I have um, stadium operations to do. We can be current, but the soccer club won't exist. 
You can't do both and think you're gonna get ahead. Who are you talking to me? I'm just I saying in general. I definitely need to start turning this around. If we lose the condo, Sabrina will be pissed. But also, he steals money from the team, so Sabrina has to take away all his credit cards. You owe $1,000, you're paying that when? When are you gonna pay us back? Pay what back? The $1,000 that you said that you were borrowing it. So I'm just, I'm just oh. you, you wrote on the check that you are borrowing it. So, oh, so in the check that you transferred to yourself. Give me the business card, Alex. Give me the cards, Alex. No, the credit cards. All right, after I pay for this meal. Give me the damn car. Now, Sabrina makes some mistakes too, namely having wildly unrealistic expectations for how many people she thinks that she can get to come to these soccer games. This is at least 25 to 30 fans right now, so I'd like to increase that by a thousand. I'll feel personally responsible if I don't fill the stands today. I'm hoping to have a better turnout than last time, hopefully. We sold 120 tickets, and that has to stop. She also definitely loses it a little bit later on. I would like $250,000 for 5%. It's just a matter of taking the 250,000 and multiplying it by 20. Right. The implied value is 5 million. What Talk do you think you would invest in? For one share, what do you think that would be? Tell me that. I mean, for 1%. So 1%. 1% of the organization. Might be $1,000. What? Do you think we're desperate? I will go shake my ass in a strip club. <laughs> but that seems pretty understandable given her situation. And I don't think you can really blame her for any of the mistakes she makes, aside from not divorcing her piece of shit husband. That doesn't stop the judges, though, from being extremely critical of her for failing to sell thousands of tickets to a semi-pro soccer game in New Jersey, a city not particularly interested in soccer. Hoping that a thousand people show up at your soccer game, then 120 people show up, that could be crushing. They're gonna have to put in some real work. It's a disappointment. It's a first failure, but this is not, okay, throw in the towel. When Sabrina and Alex meet with one of the judges, it doesn't go well. We're you should also be thinking pro. about next month we are turning in our application okay. and our money somebody's money whose money somebody Who's maybe maybe yours yes, uh -uh. yes but before that he gives her a bunch of advice about advertising on social media do something on instagram or tiktok just to figure out what works which isn't necessarily bad but doesn't change the fact that this is not going to work and the fact that these judges act like this is a reasonable business should pretty much completely disqualify them from being taken seriously as experts. Now, we'll come back to I Quit soon, but before we do, let's get into some other issues first. By the way, this is going to seem like a massive tangent, but I swear it does at least kind of tie back into the show. I Quit finished filming in early 2020 and released later that year. In the last episode, they do a brief follow-up to see how the businesses are dealing with the pandemic. But something that makes it such an interesting show, which they don't touch on, is instead of how small businesses have dealt with the pandemic, how many workers began to quit their jobs. The pandemic has put things on pause for some, and for others, worsened the problems that they were already experiencing. In both cases, these uncertain times have caused people to make changes to what they've been doing for work. <laughs> I don't know why I wrote it like that. I'm trying to imagine like the one person who doesn't know that there's a pandemic. <laughs> like I can't even do a like just woke up from a coma joke because even then that would probably be the first thing that they would find out about. Now, while these two groups of workers differ in some very important ways, one thing I'd like to focus on is the different ways that the media has covered them. You're probably aware of how the shortage of low-income workers in the service industry caused by lots of people quitting their jobs, refusing to risk their health for minimum wage, was largely described as a labor crisis. Now, one might imagine that this has something to do with stagnant wages and worsening conditions snowballing to create a labor market in which an increase in demand for labor has given workers an upper hand in negotiations. 
One might also expect to see the media, who largely uncritically support and propagate an ideology of free market competition, respond to this by saying that these struggling small businesses simply need to deal with supply and demand issues. One would also be an idiot. For the most part, the reporting on this largely focused on the poor little small business owners and how unfair and evil it was for the mean old minimum wage workers not to work for less than they were able to get. There were calls to reverse this through welfare cuts and even, my favorite, feel-good stories about retired boomers agreeing to come back to work for free so their favorite restaurants could stay open without giving their staff a raise. In order to stay open and stay ahead, owner Tanya Lepanski has brought in some unique help. Okay. The whole order is a single can of chicken. Not a new employee, but a volunteer. A group of mostly retired friends fed up with the frequent closures of their favorite restaurants. The group figured they could help fill a gap. They don't get paid. Dude, even after they retire, boomers are still fucking millennials over by scabbing for free. There's one really interesting article about this in the Montreal Gazette in which restaurant owners talked about how even when they'd raised wages as much as they could, and to be fair here, restaurants do run on notoriously slim margins, they still couldn't keep people on. It's not about the money anymore. We are offering more money than ever in our industry, which we cannot even afford. I meet with people for job interviews, and at the end of the day, they want to do something else. They're gearing themselves up for a different lifestyle. They just don't want to do this anymore. They took a step back with COVID, and they're saying, okay, what's going to make me really happy? It's not about the money. It's about the quality of life. The Serb triggered this. They got easy money for the past year. 12 months of free money gives you time to reflect about what you want to do. What's so interesting about this to me is that it gets at the fact that the vast majority of people working in the restaurant industry don't want to be. And the ones who do are usually qualified enough that they can be picky about where they decide to work. So for a little bit of background on me, before COVID, I was making the very occasional video as well as doing stand-up comedy, but mostly what I spent my time doing was working 40 plus hours a week at a restaurant. What that guy from the article said makes a lot of sense to me since before the pandemic, I would usually just get off work and not have the energy to do anything except maybe get a couple of drinks and then pass out at home. When I was laid off in March 2020 and very luckily was able to receive $2,000 a month from the Canadian government CERB program, for the first time in my adult life really, I had the chance to work on something that I actually wanted to do. <laughs> I chose this bullshit. The problem for restaurants, as is laid out very explicitly in that article, is that it's not just a matter of paying workers more, although we should definitely do that, but a much deeper one with the way a lot of these businesses operate. One example of this is scheduling. It's very rare for any restaurant employees to get full-time hours since their bosses would rather have too many people all fighting for shifts and not receiving the benefits associated with full-time employment. Another thing is just the horrible conditions of the work, especially now in a pandemic. <laughs> in my video about cooking shows, I mentioned how it's expected for people in the restaurant industry to work while sick, and I got a bunch of comments from people shocked by this. This surprised me since basically every job I've ever had has been in that industry, but for anyone surprised by this, in March 2020, right before everything locked down, I worked a shift with someone who fully had flu-like symptoms and showed up to do a double anyways and was called a hero for doing it. <laughs> I can't stress enough how completely normal that is. But even if we fixed all of that, what's so chilling to me about that article is that it's very explicit about the fact that that exhaustion that I talked about earlier is a feature, not a bug. Those industries cannot function if people have the freedom, ability, or energy to pursue their other goals. Part of why I bring all this up though is because as someone who did contribute to the labor shortage by leaving the restaurant industry, I gotta say, this is sick. <laughs> I mean, I definitely 
objectively got incredibly lucky in terms of landing this as a gig, but I would love to know how typical my experience is. Just once, I want to see coverage of this where instead of interviewing a business owner, they interviewed his former employees. Now, this isn't to say that that never happens, though. In fact, there are tons of stories that basically do exactly what I just called for, but instead of framing it as the labor shortage, they instead talk about the Great Resignation. These stories will include where are they now pieces, profiling people who quit their jobs to follow their dreams and start a business, and even explore reasons driving people to quit and give advice to managers for how to get employees to stay on that don't include going on Fox News to call for welfare cuts. My problem with this, though, is that I've only seen these kinds of stories for white collar jobs. And don't get me wrong here, I'm happy anytime someone makes their boss cry, but I think it's interesting to look at who gets encouraged to quit their jobs and who doesn't. To understand the reason for this, as well as what I think I quit is doing, let's look at the cultural role of the entrepreneur. The word entrepreneur comes from the French word, oh boy. Entreprendre? Entreprendre. Fuck! Meaning to undertake, or if you will, to hustle. By the 16th century, entrepreneur became a term used to describe someone engaged in a business venture. And then in the late 18 and early 1900s, the meaning we currently know it for emerged, popularized by the economists John Stuart Mill and John Baptiste Say. For both Mill and Say, the two defining features of an entrepreneur were creating economic value by moving resources from areas of low economic activity into areas of high economic activity, as well as the taking on of both the risks of funding a business as well as the management responsibilities of running it. Now, if someone had asked me, I would say that that definition is perfectly fine and we could stop there. but. Oh no, there's no shortage of economists writing purple prose about the romantic nature of the figure of the entrepreneur. From John G. Birch highlighting their willingness to take on risks. They are risk takers because if it were absolutely certain that economic profits could be made, there would be no risk. It would have been clear to anyone that the economic profits were available and, in a competitive environment, entry of firms into the market would have again eroded away the economic profits. Since there is uncertainty, there is always some element of risk in starting any new business endeavor. The entrepreneur is always taking a chance that the new venture will not only fail to yield economic profits, but may fail entirely. To Joseph Schumpeter describing entrepreneurship as an act of creative destruction, the opening of new markets, foreign or domestic, and the organizational development from the craft shop and factory to such concerns as US Steel illustrate the same process of industrial mutation, if I may use that biological term, that incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure from within, incessantly destroying the old one, incessantly creating the new one. This process of creative destruction is the essential fact about capitalism, it is what capitalism consists in, and what every capitalist concern has got to live in. To George Gilder's palpably aroused description of entrepreneurs as cool rebels. The entrepreneurial startup is the most creative domain in American enterprise, largely because it affords the best learning process. Because he started in rebellion against established firms, he bears a natural skepticism towards settled expertise. The entrepreneur prevails not by understanding an existing situation in all its complex particulars, but by creating a new situation which others might try to comprehend. The enterprise is an aggressive action, not a reaction. When it is successfully launched, all the rest of society, government, labor, other businesses, will have to react. It entails breaking the looking glass of established ideas, even the gleaming mirrors of executive suites, and stepping into the often greasy and fetid bins of creation. 
What I think is really interesting here is that these descriptions have a sort of mythological quality to them. And I don't think that that's an accident or purely a matter of economists being perverts. As Joseph J. Pelota writes in his essay, The Entrepreneur as Hero, the figure of the entrepreneur has come to be the one and only mythical or heroic figure in modern society. In his paper, Pelota compares the way entrepreneurs are talked about to Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, and it's eerie how well the two line up, as well as how the hero's journey perfectly describes many parts of I Quit. Look at me, tying this essay all together. For anyone not familiar, in his book The Hero with a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell describes the hero's journey, or as he calls it, the monomyth, the archetypal structure of all adventure stories in which a hero leaves home, encounters supernatural forces, wins a decisive victory, and comes home changed. It's worth noting that many people who actually study folklore think that Campbell is full of shit, and point out that he only selected stories or versions of stories that support his claims, mostly European ones and ignored all the ones that didn't. But even though, as a historical theory of folklore, the hero's journey is basically the equivalent of some deep-sounding shit your shrooms dealer heard on Joe Rogan, just like some deep shit your shrooms dealer heard on Joe Rogan, it's been unbelievably influential, to the point where it kinda has come to describe basically all adventure stories that have followed it. And both I Quit as well as the general narrative of the entrepreneur in society follow Campbell's structure. Each of the entrepreneurs in I Quit begin their stories with the call to adventure. Starting in the normalcy of a regular job, they're each called to leave and venture off into the unknown. I used to think it was a joke when people say they pay you not to follow your dreams. And even when it came to Astro Vera's, like when you tell people like, hey, I wanna own a wine company, they look at you a little, a little crazy. They all experience the refusal to the call by heavily emphasizing why it's such a big risk for them to leave their safe jobs, but ultimately do so anyway because of some supernatural aid. Uh, once a hero has embarked on their journey, they receive help and guidance of a supernatural companion. In I Quit, this takes the form of the judges slash mentors slash Obi-Wan Kenobis who provide advice to the entrepreneurs. Your business will succeed when you get really comfortable with being uncomfortable. Take out your smartphone and film a quick video of, hey, I just discovered this new way to cook ribs. Following this is the crossing of the first threshold, the point at which the hero leaves the familiar behind, venturing into the unknown, illustrated with the titular scene where they all quit their jobs. From here, they enter the belly of the whale, where the hero is swallowed up by the new and unknown world. Faced with a setback, they're forced to undergo a metamorphosis. This is shown with the entrepreneurs struggling with new and unfamiliar challenges right after they quit. They then begin the second phase known as the initiation, beginning with the road of trials, a series of tests that the hero must face, usually failing some of them. And for all of the entrepreneurs, the first one or two things that they try are failures. So with the rain, obviously we have to cancel today. The lightning is yeah. a big liability and we're standing in water. Marcus is standing in this rainy field Embarrassed in front of his wife. Son of a gun. Gosh. Oh, gosh. After this happens, the judges all stress how every entrepreneur needs to pivot or undergo a metamorphosis in order to succeed. Every entrepreneur that we're following is going to have to pivot at some point. The problem with an entrepreneur who can't pivot is that they may take the $100,000 and they may inject it into plan A. But plan A may no longer be the right plan anymore. Finally, if they're able to learn from their failures and internalize the advice they receive from the judges, they move on to apotheosis, when the hero achieves a greater understanding and moves on to the most difficult part of the journey, when they receive the ultimate boon, the thing they set out to get in the first place. In this case, the entrepreneurs land their first big deals, setting their companies on the road to further success. With this, you're going to be the preferred barbecue sauce and rub for Duke Athletics. Kind of at different events. And then you'll also have signage on the board. Look, there it goes. That's awesome. 
seeing my logo and signage going across the digital screen in front of tens of thousands of people, I absolutely think this is going to drive sales. The final part is the return, when the hero comes back to where they started, now with the boon. This can let them bestow a blessing onto their people, or just provide themselves with the lives that they would like to live. If you want an easier life for your family, you can go become a dentist. Right? Why don't you do that? If you can live that purpose-driven life, you've then created something for yourself and for your family that's just beyond. You want financial freedom. You want financial security. Financial freedom. Now, this on its own isn't particularly groundbreaking. As I said, despite being historically inaccurate, Campbell's theories have gone on to be unbelievably influential in shaping stories that have come after. And so it's not that surprising that it maps onto this shitty formulaic reality show. Also, one of the common criticisms of the monomyth is that it's often so vague that you can argue that almost anything follows its structure in some way or another, so it's not that surprising that Pelota could apply it to entrepreneurs in the real world either. But the reason this is relevant is because not only does the story of the entrepreneur follow the conventions of the hero's journey, but rather, in the neoliberal capitalist hell world we live in, the entrepreneur is the only heroic figure there is. Luke Skywalker is dead. Say hello to Elon Musk. Pelota argues that neoliberalism can be characterized by a drive to maximize the ease and frequency of transactions. The neoliberal ideal, then, is a totally connected society which allows for seamless transactions and competition between every actor in that web. While they were obviously a key figure in liberal economies, under this new interconnected economic mode, the entrepreneur is the ideal actor. They have therefore gone on to be seen as a guiding force behind technological innovation and with it, society as a whole. This is where we get the so-called knowledge-based economy. Since this new economic mode relies on constant innovation, it needs a steady flow of technology with marketable applications. To get that, through neoliberal austerity, traditional liberal institutes like universities are forced to compete for funding on a world stage by reducing all scientific research into inventing technologies that can be used by entrepreneurs to turn a profit. As Pelota writes, the knowledge-based economy, in short, comprises a field of elements conditioned by neoliberal ideology to produce and quickly commodify technological innovations. The expansion of this field tends to circumscribe the purpose of liberal institutions, such as universities, and refocuses their functions on the production of technical expertise. The entrepreneur emerges as the heroic figure in the context of this economistic field of relations, which supplants all other sources of value. Neoliberalism is more than an economic policy. It is a quasi-philosophy answering the questions, why we are here and what should I do? The answers proffered by economism are, you are here for the market and you should compete. If one does not participate in the market, one has failed the neoliberal personal ethic, the vision that every human being is an entrepreneur managing their own life and should act accordingly. The ideal entrepreneur is one whose friends, hobbies, sports, and social and romantic partners effectively maximize their status. That is, all these elements effectively network on a system of purely economic value. Such social action is monetized and extends the market principle into neoeconomic forms of life. In general, the ethical precepts of neoliberalism can be summarized as 1. Act in conformity with market forces. 2. Within this limit, act also to maximize the opportunity for others to conform to the forces generated by your actions. 3. Hold no other goals. That quote basically summarized I quit. But the darkest thing about this show, which I haven't really talked about yet, is the incredibly inhuman way the judges talk about the contestants. Each part of their lives gets broken down to be judged purely on the basis of the economic value that it brings to their business. In the first episode, when Marcus says probably the most milk toast things possible about loving his family, it cuts to the judges worrying that that'll get in the way of what's really important 
his fledgling cooler business. I want to build a business that I can ultimately hand off to my children, and particularly my son, Cal. So the flip side of this deep emotional connection that Marcus has to the business because of his son and his family is that he's so nervous. He knows that his kids and his wife are relying on him. And I wonder if that's going to affect his ability to make really good decisions. Compare that to how they react to Mike D talking about how the death of his son motivated him to work extra hard on his barbecue sauce. When it was time to start the business, one of the things that crossed my mind was just Aaron and how he, as a baby, he couldn't make an excuse, right? He couldn't say, oh, no, I don't want to do this anymore. He just kind of had to try to live. I needed to sort of take that same mentality and like not make excuses about why I couldn't do certain things, just, just do it. Mike D said something so interesting, he said, our child had no choice but to survive. And I believe that Mike D has no choice but to survive. He is there fighting. Mike has the potential to turn that adversity into an incredible motivation, almost like using it instead of his kryptonite as a superpower. Absolute ghouls. <laughs> this guy was legit just like, hmm, not loving the whole wanting to provide for his son thing. Might make him a bit too risk averse. Now, if his son was dead though, they do the same thing with the relationships of everyone on the show. I think that might be most explicit with how they talk about Mateo and Julia. They just need to align. They need to become real co-founders, leverage each other's strengths, and mitigate each other's weaknesses. It gets much grosser though. When Jen is signing the lease to what will become her store, the judges say that her husband is a bad partner because he A, didn't quit his job, and B, didn't stop her from renting a retail space. You know, a true business partner would be holding her accountable. It doesn't feel like Jesse is holding Jen accountable. And in fact, the fact that he has not quit his own day job yet tells me that I'm not even sure he's really into this thing to begin with. Compare that to when they hear about Alex, an actually terrible partner, blowing his and Sabrina's retirement money on a soccer team. Clearly, the trust battery of this relationship is really, really low. By the way, whenever the judges talk about them, Sabrina is kind of the only one they really criticize. Sabrina is the publicist. Like, she is an expert. She should know how to get butts and seats. Sounds like she just came undone. And for someone like her, we want our entrepreneurs to keep a level of composure. And if she can't do that, what would she do with a fan? The worst thing they ever really say about Alex is just that he was too quiet in a meeting with an investor. And the worst part is, Alex, the founder of this entire thing, said maybe 10 words the entire time. This makes no sense, except in a context where good is defined as maximizing market interaction. I mean, say what you will about Alex, he has certainly gotten him and Sabrina way more involved in the market. And at the end of the day, isn't that what being a good spouse is really all about? Sorry, I feel like all my recent videos have just done the same thing where it's like, here's this reality show and here's how it ties into this novel definition of neoliberalism. But here's the conclusion where I say that this wouldn't be bad if not for neoliberalism. But actually, like being an entrepreneur does not need to be like this. Going back to that original definition, we want creative and innovative people, and there's no reason why that needs to be tied to acting like a sociopath. In fact, it's probably better if it's not. Pilota points out how this kind of creative thinking involves a form of play that's hampered by a pressing need to turn a profit. There's a reason why most of the technological innovations that we most rely on, from microprocessors to GPS to the internet, were made in government labs that didn't need to turn a profit. But unfortunately, until we get a better system, I don't think that we'll get any better heroes than these. Thanks for watching. Thanks so much for making it to the end. Once again, this video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Click that link in the description to get 83% off for two years plus an additional three months for free.
The less I make, the less I care about 